The Mishcon Academy Digital Sessions. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Leanne Maund, and I'm a corporate lawyer in the Hospitality and Leisure Group at Mishcon Dorea. This is a Mishcon Academy Digital Session a series of online events, videos and podcasts looking at the biggest issues faced by businesses and individuals today. This afternoon, I'm chairing a discussion with four operators and experts in the restaurant industry to discuss the outlook for the sector as it reacts to the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so I'd like to introduce our panel. Firstly, we have George Bukov, co-founder at Burger and Lobster Restaurant Group. Petra Barron, is a British entrepreneur and the founder of London street food collective, Curb. Daryl Connell is a partner at Imbiba and he leads the investment team. And finally, Payam Kigabadi. Payam is a founding partner of the Dow Schofield Watts London corporate finance team, specialising in the consumer, leisure and hospitality sectors. In our conversation today, I'm going to ask the panel to give us their perspectives on the restaurant industry now, what's going to happen in the few months, and although impossible to predict what they think the longer term future of the restaurant industry will look like. Firstly, I wonder if our panelists can just give us a, a view on how the industry has adapted to the challenges posed by the pandemic and how's it coping and for Petra and George in particular as operators, what does business look like now? So Petra, if it's okay, I'd like to go to you first. Um, thanks very much, Leanne. Um, it's just mad how, how everything just becomes normal, doesn't it? Even though it's kind of horrific, it's everything sort of normalises and you're just sort of used to it. But the fact is that none of our markets are reopened apart from one, which is not doing very well. There's just not enough people there. Like all of our lunch markets are in high footfall office areas. Um, that's been our model. So they're all just gone. So our main market is Seven Dials Market, which is also in central London. Um, but it's got a roof over its head and um, it's doing as well as it could be given that there's not many people around there, but um, it's probably 75% down on what we would have expected. And yeah, it's it's just completely different in many ways, but in lots of ways it's, it's the same, it's the same kind of impetus to serve great food and give people a good time. And George, given that you're uh, latest venture was so new when when we started all of this generally we are uh, uh, between 30 and 65 percent of uh, uh, last year of or what it should be surprisingly um, uh, the spend in all of the locations is up I think it's a, a general sort of effect uh, throughout the industry where people have less chances to enjoy themselves and they, they go out and they spend more. Uh, so how we adapted, first of all, with menus and hours and days of trade um, to um, make the business models a bit more efficient and, and think what can we do for those customers and how can we be the best for those customers who actually decided to come. And so, Daryl, I'd like to come to you next. Lots of restaurant owners have had to seek additional finance um, in order to stabilise their balance sheet. And so far, the first port of call has been grants, loans, other measures, etc. But um, that's likely to come to an end soon. And I just wondered what you think is, is, is next in terms of reacting to all of this. Yeah, look, it's been a it's been a turbulent few months. You know, everyone has pulled down their, whatever they can get in terms of grants. And then there's obviously the C-bills and then there's furlough and all of these different initiatives. With regards to bank funding C-bills, we didn't want all of our companies to sort of take loads of bank debt because I don't really think that's a prudent way to run young businesses in general. Um, but we've all we've taken a measured amount where appropriate. And I think I think we're coming into the sort of next phase of this. I think the big thing that still needs resolving is around the whole rent piece. Um, you know, there's all this reg legacy rent arrears. Some of, you know, so a lot of people, including ourselves, we haven't agreed everything with all our landlords. When the moratorium lifts in December, that's going to be a big balance sheet issue for a number of companies and how they resolve that. And the government and government support and government-led funding initiatives is not going to be the answer in every regard. We know that. 
Payam, I'd like to bring you in here. So I think we all know there, there have been some really difficult conversations between operators and landlords recently. How has the relationship shifted, do you think? Yeah, so in, in terms of the, the, the landlord-tenant relationship, I mean, this was a contentious issue for most of my clients pre-COVID. Um, tenants have historically struggled with the upwards, upwards only rent reviews. Um, and I think what COVID has done is it's, it's somewhat rebalanced the conversation. Uh, and with regards to brand new leases, um, I absolutely believe the dynamic has shifted and it's for once in a, in a generation, it's, it's a tenants friendly market. I think that in the longer term, it's, there's probably gonna be a more equitable um, arrangement and, and relationship whereby it's gonna be somewhere between pre-COVID um, sort of five, ten years ago, uh, and also, um, you know, the scenario that we're in right now. Yeah. Um, what do you guys think the government could be doing to support the sector? The VAT uh, reduction is the, the biggest one. Uh, I mean, it's, it's sim- in simple words, it's just, uh, it's just cash. It's, it's real money. I would think that to support the hospitality sector, the government has to definitely extend the VAT reduction further, probably till the end of next year. We all understand that the impact of COVID is much, much longer than January or February, you know. Uh, Payam, I'm going to come back to you in terms of, um, do you think there's anything more the government should be doing? I, th- I think from, from longer term support, um, I think we come back to the, the ugly word of business rates. Um, I think that's something that has been at the forefront of most operators' minds, particularly in London, for a long time. And I think that's an area which really needs a review. I think in sort of more immediate COVID support, as Dowell alluded to earlier, it's about supporting those balance sheets and and, and propping up those balance sheets with recapitalization, in my mind, via equity. But it's all about investment into that sector, tax efficient for the incoming investor at the right valuation and securing the, the lifeblood of these businesses, but also giving these businesses the best chance to thrive post COVID. Because I do believe it's a once in a generation opportunity for good businesses to get through this to grow in 2021 and 2022 and and perhaps open four or five sites per year when, you know, naturally it was, you know, one or two sites per year. And Daryl, given that Payam's just been talking about bringing investment in, what do you think the the investment and M&A landscape is going to look like for the next sort of 12 to 18 months? And what are investors going to be looking for? The, the M&A market is going to be very, very quiet in the next 12 to 24 months for what, what you would traditionally call buyout. So M&A specifically, mergers and acquisitions specifically, I think it will be very buoyant for fundraising and growth capital type rounds. So this, rather than selling your business per se, you'll raise a million, five million, 10 million of equity or, and or debt to effectively strengthen your balance sheet and shore up the future of the business. In terms of the opportunities that are out there, I mean, we're broadly seeing things fall into three buckets. Um, the first bucket is a distressed stuff. So stuff that's going through a, a, some form of pre-pack or process where, you know, might, you know, brands such as Byron or Carluccio's or these things have all been in the press or the GPK or whoever, um, where you can pay not very much for them. But, you don't, you know, it's, it's, you know, you've got to question the longevity of these businesses, where are they going to end up, et cetera, et cetera. Second thing is around, is, is around businesses which are, you know, they, they're really, really, they were good businesses, but their balance sheets were a bit stretched on the way into this. And now they really need funding just to normalize themselves. And then the third, the third bucket is really good businesses, which were doing really, really well prior to lockdown, who now actually want to raise capital to expand quicker because they want to take advantage of the property opportunities, et cetera, that Pyme and the others have mentioned. So, it's really about risk appetite in every regard. Okay, thank you. And uh, George, you, you spoke about already that consumer habits have changed slightly. You're getting fewer people in, but they're, but they're spending more. How do you think consumer habits are going to change as we, as we head into winter and you know, outdoor dining probably isn't an option? And how can operators prepare for the, the next six months? Well, the simple advice is uh, invest in your best people you know obviously don't try and save on 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 the guest on on customer experience invest and people will be will remember the guests will the team will remember the guests will remember and when covid is over those uh points that the the restaurants won 
with customers, they will all kind of come to fruition and, and those businesses will perform better than the others because they've been so good to their customers. There's lots and lots of businesses have, have had to pivot. We saw even sort of super high-end restaurants moving to um, offer delivery services, etc. And, you know, then, of course, you had businesses creating, selling new product, products, DIY meal kits. Petra, do you think that that trend to sort of, I don't know, diversify or or do new things is is going to continue after the, the the pandemic i think diversification is is absolutely crucial mobility getting your food to where the people are not being tethered to one space uh you know one one location um is really important and and just yeah just really thinking about how obviously people are always going to need to eat and people are always going to want to come together over food and it's figuring out new ways of letting that happen Payam, Petra just spoke about uh, businesses pivoting and um, diversifying a bit. And uh, one thing that I would quite like to talk about is uh, the implementation of tech. So some of that's been reactionary with QR codes and ordering via an app, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but do you think there's a future for increased tech in our dining experience? Well, absolutely. If, from a financial point of view. Um, if tech helps drive margins, then for my, for my, for my clients and, and from a valuation perspective, that's great. In terms of sort of technology, I'm sure there'll be new and more interesting types of technology that arise. Um, it's only going in one direction. Um, and if it, the more the technology becomes cost effective, um, so it's not just the McDonald's of the world that can afford the, the ordering technology and the queuing systems, then, then absolutely, it'll be much more common in more of the high street restaurants across across the country. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Petra. There's there's been a huge shift in ways of working and um, people's perspective on on work life balance and and what they're working for. What do you think that operating in the sector will look like in the future in terms of operators as human beings? Anyone who wants to get their business back up and running and thriving is going to have to need a lot of energy to do it. And I think that's going to cause in itself a lot of people to go, do I have that in me? Because actually there's probably easier ways of doing this. So it's going to almost like filter out even more the passion, like the real kind of like drive and passion for beyond I can make money. It's like, do I actually want to spend my life doing this in such a tenuous world? Like, what do I actually want to put my energy into? What do I really care about? In, in recent years, and especially how businesses have reacted to the pandemic, um, all industries have, have come under increasing scrutiny for putting profit ahead of purpose. I'd be interested to hear from all of you on what you think the restaurant industry can, can do to improve its contribution to society as a whole. So I think in the shorter term, it's about the individuals. It's about the individual owners and the individual management teams and effectively ensuring that they're good people and at the heart of it, they're trying to build good businesses and that their staff and the, and the environment and, and you know, everything, all green issues are at the forefront of their mind alongside customers and profit. I then think it's the responsibility of the customers, so everyone who's all panelists on this call and everyone listening, that we dine at the businesses which make positive contributions to society. A big part of due diligence for us when we make any investment into a new company is around the whole staff, um, you know, culture, but also staff retention. That tells you an enormous amount about a business. If a business has got really good staff retention and a really good culture in it, you often know that it has a very good social and comp purpose. That shows you that the management team are putting back into the staff. So we have big programs across all our companies around training, around career development, and all of that's really, really yeah. important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and George, um, I'd, I'd like to hear from you in terms of what you think the industry can, can do to better contribute to society as a whole. I feel that in the future, the, the restaurants will be even more important as the place uh, for people to meet and socialize because people want to see each other in real life as much as, you know, technology is great, of course. Uh, I don't believe that's ever going to go away. So restaurants are going to be, and hospitality is going to be even more, you know, more important. And I think uh, more expensive. I think uh, people in hospitality 
all the way from uh, kitchen porter to general manager and the business owner, they, they will all make more money because it's it's really, really about people. They, they are creating the experience. They are creating the, the magic. And that is a good note to end on, I think. Uh, it's nice to end on an optimistic message. So thank you, George. And thank you to the rest of you for uh, giving up your time today and for all of your insight. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. The Mishkan Academy Digital Sessions. To access advice for businesses that is regularly updated, please visit mishkan.com.